Amongst the bitterness of recession, the music scene was in a state of flux. Emerging from the revolution of punk, which had swept away much of the indulgence of rock, music developed new genres like electronic music and rap, and embraced influences such as ska and reggae. As the motor industry withered in the Midlands, Jerry Dammer's two-tone label emerged from Coventry, releasing records from Midlands bands like The Beat, The Selector, and one of the most important bands to emerge in the early Thatcher era, The Specials. I'm Jerry Dammer's. I was the founder of The Specials. I wrote for myself about my personal life and then try and make it relate to the whole world, you know. <laughs> On the road in the specials, we saw the country falling apart under Thatcher's monetarism. It was just going completely crazy and uh, millions of people were being put on the dole, you know, whole industries being closed down. The Specials, a group combining the ska rhythms of Jamaica with acute observation of contemporary misery. In Ghost Town, it was unemployment. Racist Friend was about race relations. Too Much Too Young was teenage pregnancy. For all the 13-year-old girls who don't know what their future is. Too Much Too Young. You don't too much, much too young. I think uh, all the, that stuff, the specials and um, the special AKA, had uh, it was danceable, but I think I got that probably from reggae music, which also had a lot of political messages, but, you know, all reggae music you have to be able to, to dance to, as opposed to rock music, which, um, well, some people can dance to it, but uh, it's not very easy. The dance ability was always an essential part of it. I think you can get across messages that way. That it's not just like a political speech. People can still be in uh, an enjoyable time while taking it in, you know. And this was a protest song fired at point blank range. The beat's highly danceable. Stand down, Margaret. A pop song demanding the Prime Minister's resignation? This was unusual territory. Pop responding so closely to politics. Stand down, Margaret, stand down, please stand down, Margaret. The story goes that the band had to be a little creative with the truth in order to perform the song on the children's TV show Cheggers Plays Pop in 1980. The saxophonist, Saxa, persuaded presenter Keith Chegwin that the stand-down Margaret was a traditional Caribbean dance and demonstrated a few steps. Then, when the Beat were playing the song, they unzipped their jackets to reveal Maggie Thatcher t-shirts. It wasn't just in their lyrics that two-tone bands like The Beat were political. They proudly presented a defiant stance against the status quo. Their rude boy image and their black and white logo, emphasizing their multiracial lineups too. They were responding to social issues, especially racism, continuing the campaign started by the highly successful Rock Against Racism movement of the late 70s. It's surprising and quite shocking, really, how few multiracial bands there are. You know, there were the equals in the 60s and um, a few funk bands in the 70s. 
and that was quite a healthy scene. But um, the idea was to combine white rock music with black music, you know, that was the idea of the special. But it's surprising how few times people have tried that, really. I'm Gary Bushell, uh, and in 1979, when Maggie Thatcher was elected, I was working on Sounds, the premier rock weekly in the UK. To me, what made the special so great was that they took the message of Rock Against Racism and embodied it. Rather than preaching politics, they actually were showing what multiracial bands could be like, sound like, and, and that whole non-racist experience was embodied in them. Jazzy B. When you look at the artists and uh, what they were doing musically, it was certainly something that you could identify with, you know, with the whole idea of the scar and, you know, the quirkiness of it being from the UK. But for me personally, it was just another form of pop music. Apartheid was a huge area of dissent, with the Thatcher government standing firmly against the sanctions that the ANC pleaded for. Written by Jerry Dammers, Special AKA released Free Nelson Mandela, put the face of the imprisoned ANC leader on the front and brought the apartheid issue to general notice. Jerry Dammers. Like a lot of early special songs, it's basically just three notes. It's just a very, very simple tune and then, you know, make it interesting by playing interesting stuff around it, like the, the brass line. So that's what made it interesting, but it was just a very catchy, simple tune with three notes. Uh, I think that's partly what made it effective. Well, the, the the lyric was that deaf, dumb and blind thing. Dare I say it, it probably came from Tommy originally. <laughs> but uh, it just seemed like an obvious thing to, to attack the apartheid regime. This is protest music, essentially. Robert Elms again. And yet it isn't a mournful bloke with a guitar strumming away, you know, in a warbling voice. It's off, it's music to dance to, it's celebratory. Free Nelson Mandela, you can't get a more up record than that. It's kind of evangelical. Drawing on musical influences from South Africa, the song reached number nine in the UK charts and was immensely popular in Africa. Jerry Dammers went on to set up Artists Against Apartheid, which attracted 20,000 people to a free concert in Clapham Common in 1986. Two years later, the Nelson Mandela 70th birthday tribute concert was staged at Wembley Stadium. That featured international and UK artists, including Stevie Wonder, Al Green, Sting, George Michael and Dire Straits. It was broadcast to an audience of 600 million in 67 countries. Jerry Dammers. I think the, the Mandela concerts did have an effect because they were so huge that governments do have to take some popular opinion into account. We managed to take over the BBC for a day, you know, with that concert. And um, if you can take over a TV station for a day, you can cause a minor revolution. You know, that's how the Soviet uh, bloc was brought down, by people taking over the TV stations. And that's what, in effect, we did, you know, because whoever controls the TV station, that's controls popular opinion. The event was regarded by many, including the anti-apartheid movement and the African National Congress, as raising worldwide consciousness of the imprisonment of ANC leader Mandela and others by the South African apartheid government and forcing the regime to release Mandela earlier than would otherwise have happened.